Well, it's a joy to be with you this morning. Uh, coming back from sabbatical, I can't tell you how excited I am to see so many of your faces and to have the opportunity to bring God's word to you. Uh, I almost had a heart attack a minute ago as Dr. Allen announced I was preaching on the book of James, and I thought, I thought that was Dr. Yates, uh, and sure enough, it is. So I am here, still breathing. We will actually be in the Gospel of John this morning, so open there to John chapter 1, John chapter 5. Of course, I wouldn't put it past Dr. Allen, as he would put one over me like that, let me also just say, uh, it's not just a privilege to preach to you this morning, but to have my family here, my wife, Elizabeth, and my children, uh, as well, it's just so unique to have my own father here, my own dad. Uh, I owe so much to him in terms of just being, staying here this morning, in terms of hearing the gospel as a child, uh, being encouraged to read books, and of course, embrace Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord. You may think that I'm a bit morbid. I often think about death. My wife, Elizabeth, gives me a hard time for this morose quality, but allow me to defend myself this morning. I imagine that when death comes for each of us, most of the worries of this life will be secondary to that one Main concern, am I right with God? That question can create enormous anxiety. In that moment of worry, what will calm your anxiety? It should be nothing less than the gospel of Jesus Christ. In that final hour, we rest on his finished work the complete, definitive work of our Lord and Savior. But the more I've thought about death, and by this point you're probably thinking my wife is on to something, the more I've thought about death, the more another epiphany sort of smacks me upside the head. When we die, the great triumph of the strange new world that we will enter will not be what is there so much as who is there? Our triune God. For that reason, I worry that some pastors, some of us perhaps, may be greatly disappointed when we enter life after death. Perhaps they've labored hard in the church, fixing their attention Sunday in, Sunday out, to preach about what God has done. But as for who God is, well, that's the stuff of speculation. In their minds, perhaps what God does in history is Bible, but who God is in eternity, that's metaphysical. And notice how Christian this mindset can sound in an effort to be gospel-centered, as we should be, we might just forget who the gospel is all about. Not us, but God. In this mindset, who God is in and of himself, even apart from this world, may have nothing to do with my salvation and therefore the deep things of God. It's then concluded, well, these deep things of God, they cannot be the focus, let alone the foundation of life and worship in the church. But for most of history, this was not the Christian mindset. God was not a means to my end. God was the end. Doctrine's importance was not determined by relevancy, contemplating who God is apart from us or what he might do for us was not only considered the first and greatest aspiration, but the greatest focus you could possibly have in Christian living. 
sometimes even the very nucleus of Christian worship. You've seen that this morning already. As for matters of salvation, God's works in history, yes, those are considered absolutely essential, central to the life of the church. However, there was a common understanding that the very foundation on which salvation stands is nothing less than the deep things of God. Now, I know what you're thinking. These professors, they love to talk in theory. Well, allow me to move from theory to reality by means of the blessed Trinity. As we open the scriptures this morning, we will discover that the economy of salvation is entirely dependent on a key component of our imminent trinity. But since we can't, of course, explore all of Scripture, as tempting as that might be, we will invite John and his gospel in particular to introduce us to several snapshots, word and begetting and light and life. My aim this morning is to give you a fresh perspective. Who God is in and of himself is absolutely foundational for the gospel and our salvation. With that said, look at John's opening chapter and ask yourself this question. How does John begin his gospel? Yes, of course, we'd love to jump to the latter half of chapter 1 which, of course, concerns the incarnation. But in order to establish the incarnation, how does John begin? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John intends his readers to know from the very start that Jesus' divine existence didn't begin like every other man's. Existence. In fact, it never began. His past is unlike our past, without a genesis, but it is to be traced to God Himself in eternity. Never was there a time when God was without His Word. We know from the rest of John's chapter that this Word is none other than than the Son of God himself. Verses 14 and 18 reveal this much as the eternal origin of the word is none other than God the Father. And yet, unlike human sons, the word, the Son, has no starting point of generation. He is, as shocking as this may have been to some of John, John's readers, he is from eternity. For not only was the word with God, he says, but the word was God. When John turns then to the miracle of the incarnation, he presupposes this eternal sonship within the imminent Godhead. In verse 14, we read, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Son is the resplendent effulgence of the glory of God. Glory conveys the Son's familial origin. He is the glory of God because he is none other than the Son of God, the very radiance of his Father. He is, as both Hebrews 1, as well as the Nicene Creed says, light from light. But don't finish, don't fail to finish, that is, the rest of verse 14. The word's glory is the glory of the only begotten of the Father. Let's not forget what the Father's eternal origin means for his Son, the word. 
the one in whom such glory radiates, as John says in verse 18, no man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. I also love how the NASB translates this this, uh, verse 18. No one has seen God at any time. There, I think it's picking up on the book of Deuteronomy. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. Notice the context once more. The Son is located where? In the very bosom of the Father, to use that old-fashioned English. The reason John can say the Word was sent by the Father to become flesh, to dwell among us, is why? Because the Word is none other than the Son whose origin is from the Father begotten from the Father, from eternity, the Son can then be sent by the Father to become incarnate in history. That explains why he alone, as the Word, can reveal the Father. God as God may be hidden from our very finite gaze, But if he who is begotten, he who is in the very bosom of the Father, becomes flesh and even dwells among us, then this God is made known to us. Again, John moves. He loves to do this throughout his gospel. He loves to move back and forth between eternity and history. And the context in which he does this is filial every time. You may have noticed that some contemporary translations, as good as they are, sometimes only refer to the Son as the only of his kind, or the unique Son, or the only Son. Many scholars are now recognizing that both the wording and especially the context of John refers to a metaphorical, biological meaning. And older translations, well, they may have been on to something when they use that phrase, only begotten, to refer to the Son. I love what Charles Lee Irons has to say. John views Christ as the only begotten Son of God in the sense that he is the Father's only proper offspring, deriving his being, his divine being, from the Father. Sonship and begetting go hand in hand. They define each other. Now, for some of you, this concept of eternal begetting or eternal generation may sound very new. That word generation means coming forth. And with reference to the Trinity, it refers to the Son coming forth from the Father's essence, but from all eternity. A son is, by definition, one who is generated by his father, one who has his origin from his father. And when this metaphorical, biological language and concept is used of the son of God, as it so often is by the authors of Scripture, it means in its most basic sense that this eternal son is from his father. There are, of course, legions of dissimilarities between human and divine generation. Unlike human generation, there is no division of nature. There's no multiplication of essence, no priority or posteriority, no motion, no mutation, no alteration, and certainly no corruption. These and others are what I like to call nine marks of a unhealthy generation. But we cannot miss the one fundamental similarity. Sonship means one is generated by a father. An eternal generation then means that from all eternity, the father communicates the one simple, undivided divine essence to his son. 
the biblical names themselves, give away these persons' eternal relation of origin. That's by design. The father is only father if he begets or generates the son. And the son is only son if he is begotten or generated by his father. It's hard to say it better than Augustine. When we say begotten, we mean the same as when we say son. Being son is a consequence of being begotten, and being begotten is implied by being son. Eternal generation serves several purposes. On the one hand, and this is the beauty of the doctrine, on the one hand, eternal generation is what distinguishes the son as son. One of my favorite Baptist theologians, John Gill, liked to say it this way, without his eternal generation, no proof can be made of his being a distinct divine person in the Godhead. On the other hand, Eternal generation also safeguards the Son's total equality and divinity. In the fourth century, there was a group within the church known as Arians. They argued that the unity between the Father and the Son was merely a unity of will or wills. The Son was a product or a mere effect of the Father's will. There was then a time when the Son was not. But to counter this argument, the church father said the unity between the father and the son, echoing a passage like John 10, this unity between the father and the son is a unity of nature. They argued that the only reason the son is homoousios, from the same nature as the father, is because the son is begotten from the Father's usia, or nature, and from all eternity. The church then gathered from east and west to confess what we now call the Nicene Creed, that the Son is the only begotten Son of God, begotten from the Father before all time, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not created." of the same essence as the Father, through whom all things came into being. And listen to this. On the basis of this Son's eternal origin, the Nicene Fathers then concluded that this same Son came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit. Why? For us for us and our salvation. Does this sound at all familiar to you? It should. How many of you parents have taught your children that famous Johannine passage, John 3, 16? For God so loved the world, what? That he gave his only begotten son. You see, the reason it is so fitting for the Father to send His Son in history is because the Son is begotten from the Father from eternity. Eternal generation, then, is not based on just a word or a translation. Whenever Jesus says He has been sent from the Father, and there's no shortage of that language in the Gospel of John, is there? Well, he is assuming he is from the Father from before all ages. For that is the very basis of his mission. What makes his mission possible to begin with. Now, to see this more clearly, let's turn to that second snapshot, light in life. And let's listen, shall we? Let's listen to Jesus himself. In John chapter 5, when the one who is begotten before all ages descends to redeem God's covenant people, that's you, by the way. Does he in any way manifest his eternal origin to his listeners? And if so, does he see his eternal origin as at all essential to his mission? In John 5, we learn that there is this pool 
where the blind and paralyzed linger. They believe that perhaps if I can just get into the pool when the water begins to stir, maybe, just maybe, I will be healed. But most days, nothing happened. Nothing changed. Except one day, something did change. Jesus walked up to the pool, turned, and makes eye contact with a crippled man. He can't even get up. A man who had sat there for 38 years. And with a word, with a word, Jesus commands him, get up. Start walking. I mean, can you imagine what that must have been like to to be there as you are watching this? To everyone's shock, the man stands up and starts walking. Everyone, I like to think, everyone must have been overjoyed. Of course, everyone but those religious leaders, right? Who chafed at the sight of this man carrying his mat on the Sabbath. Long story short, these Jews confront Jesus, condemning him for violating the Sabbath. And Jesus' reply infuriates them. My father is working until now, and I am working. According to these religious leaders, not only was Jesus breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father. Making himself equal with God. Clearly, he's not calling God his father like we would. The Jews knew that God created the heavens and the earth and then rested on the seventh day. But since he is God, he alone can sustain the universe. And he alone has the right to do so on the Sabbath. This is his prerogative. So when Jesus said that his father is working until now, and so is he, Jesus was making a divine claim. Yes, even a Trinitarian claim. The Jews, perhaps they misunderstood Jesus as if he's claiming to be a second rival deity, discarding the monotheism of their fathers. But the close listener might have noticed that Jesus was claiming to be one with God the Father as he who is the Son from the Father. What Jesus said next revealed far more about his identity. Verse 24, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Promising that a future day is coming, one in which those who hear his voice, the voice of the Son of God himself, will live. Jesus then says something extraordinary. Verse 26, for as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. What does Jesus mean? Augustine has the answer. Jesus did not mean that the Father gave life to the Son already existing without life, but that he begot him timelessly in such a way that the life which the Father gave the Son by begetting him is co-eternal with the life of the Father who gave it. And notice, notice, for Jesus, his eternal origin from the Father, this is what substantiates his life-giving mission of resurrection. Verses 28 through 29, since he has been granted to have life in himself, he can then descend to our death-ridden world and promise that all those united to him will experience resurrection life on the last day. Friends, we are standing 
at the base of Mount Everest. Time does not permit us to to climb higher. It shouldn't surprise us that the the New Testament authors followed Jesus' lead from image in Colossians to radiance and imprint in Hebrews and Psalms to wisdom in Proverbs and 1 Corinthians to ancient of days in Malachi and Matthew. But I trust we've seen just a glimpse, just enough for us to draw out several applications. As I said at the start, my aim this morning is to give you a fresh perspective. Who our triune God is, in and of himself, is foundational for a right understanding of what he does. If you read Scripture as God intended, as an integrated whole rather than disparate parts, and with the triune God himself as the one divine author who has revealed himself across the whole sweep of redemptive history, then eternal generation is seen for what it really is, the warp and woof of the Bible, a a doctrine on which the entire story depends. Consider three implications. First, eternal generation is essential, essential to the gospel. I hope you've picked up on this. It is only because Jesus is the eternally begotten son that he is able and qualified to descend into the deep depths of this God-forsaken world be born as a babe in a manger and ascend back to his father with a host of newborn sons behind him. Unless he is begotten from the father from all eternity, he cannot be sent by the father to be born a man in salvation history. Nor can he ensure that those who have trusted in him as the only begotten son of God will be adopted as sons themselves. Only one who is the son of God himself, begotten from the very essence of the father, is qualified, let alone capable, of reconciling a fallen humanity under eternal condemnation to the father. Second, if Jesus is not the eternal, only begotten son of God, then friends, we have no hope nor any right to call God our Father in the first place. Now, to clarify, there is a massive difference between the Son's sonship and our sonship, isn't there? His sonship is by nature, eternally begotten from the Father's essence, whereas our sonship is by grace as John 20, 17 points out. I love what the church father Hillary said about this. For he is God's true and own son by origin and not by adoption, not by name only, but in truth, born, not created. This nature-grace distinction affects how we even define divine love. Think about this. Is Christ the Son because the Father loves him? Or does the Father love him because he is the Son? The latter must be true if he is the Son by nature, from eternity, rather than, say, an adopted Son at some point in time by grace, only to be loved thereafter. I love what Francis Turretin, that post-Reformation reformer, said. He is not the son because he is beloved, but he is beloved because he is the son. Now, that clarification aside, this is the point. Only if he is the son of the father by nature 
can we boldly approach the throne of the Father by grace? The Father, through his Son, has accomplished our redemption. And we, as a result, are the recipients of his Son's grace a thousand times over. Is this not what Paul assumes when he's writing to the Galatians in Galatians 4 about their adoption? We, as his adopted sons, have life in the eternal Son. Through him, the Spirit communicates to us the Father's everlasting benevolence. As recipients of his everlasting grace, as benefactors of his unceasing mercy, we cry out to him, Abba, Father, with every confidence that he will receive us as sons in his Son. Galatians 4, 7, so you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. Last, only if the son is eternally generated from the father, do we have any hope? Do you have any hope? Does the world have any hope that they will be regenerated? Unless he is born from the Father from all eternity, we have little confidence that we will be born again and enter into the kingdom of the Son. Isn't this Jesus, the very pinpoint of Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus in John 3? Or perhaps we should revisit John 5, 26. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. You see, only he who has life in himself can give life to those, to you and me, who so desperately need it. That should empower our evangelism. We do not hold out to the world a Savior who hopes he can turn this world around. We hold out to the world a world lost in death and darkness, a Savior who can raise the dead to new life. It's for that reason that that evangelist, Augustine, boldly summoned unbelievers everywhere to look to none other than the only begotten Son. What about you, soul? You were dead. You had lost life. Listen, listen to the Father through the Son. Arise, receive life in order that the life which you do not have in yourself, you may receive in the one who does have life in himself. Maybe Augustine's words sound strange to you. Maybe Augustine sounds strange to you. Perhaps a more familiar tune will sound a little bit closer to home. A tune you sing, I know our family sings every Christmas season. Hark, the herald angels sing. You remember that third stanza of Charles Wesley's timeless hymn? Hail, the heaven-born Prince of Peace. Hail the Son of Righteousness, light and life to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. Mild he lays his glory by, born that man no more may die, born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. Brothers and sisters, apart from the only begotten Son, begotten from the Father, from all eternity, we have no confidence, no assurance that we will be and are reborn. The Son of Earth only receives 
second birth, if this prince of peace is heaven born. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen? Amen.